And I'm Nikki Jovakic from Look Up Strata. Thank you so much for joining us for this final session of the webinar series on the WA reforms. Whether you've been with us for all three sessions, been jumping in and out, or whether, or, or whether you're just watching the recording here today, we're grateful for your support. We've see, received so many encouraging messages from you over the past few weeks, and one in particular caught my attention, and I just wanted to read it out to everyone. So first, I'd like to say a great big hello to Glenda and the fellow residents at Glenda's Over 55s Complex. Glenda emailed me earlier this week to say thank you for the fantastic webinars. A few owners have gathered to listen to the Look Up Strata webinars, which have been a great help in understanding parts of the new bylaws, especially for large over 55s complexes. We feel there are limited avenues to obtain strata title information that is easy to understand for elderly owners. So a huge thank you to you and your team. So thanks very much for those kind words, Glenda. And of course, we could not have brought these sessions to you without the help of our presenters. And today we're so happy to welcome Leonie Milanis from PSC Property Link Insurance Brokers and Shane White from Strata Title Consult. Shane will be presenting on clearer bylaws, council and strata management requirements and other changes to the legislation. Welcome to the session, Shane. Thank you. And this also, uh, this presentation will be followed by Leonie Milanis presenting on insurance requirements and changes to terminology. Thanks so much for joining us, Leonie. Thank you, Nikki. A copy of the recording will be sent out tomorrow. So please keep an eye out for that. And if you could forward that email on to others who may benefit from the information, we'd really appreciate it. We'll be also sharing the slide presentations of the sessions on the Look Up Strata blog. And these will be out soon. So keep an eye out on the newsletters that we're sending out and we'll make the announcement there. Now, if you're a strata manager who's a member of SCA WA, don't forget to claim your SCA CPD points for the sessions. Each session is worth half a CPD point. And if you have attended the full series of the, of the webinars, it's worth one and a half points. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that the information contained in this session, including the discussions that arise from submitted questions, is not legal advice and should not be replied, relied upon as legal advice. You should seek independent advice before acting on the information contained in these sessions. During the presentations, once again, I'll be jumping into chat and moderating, so please say hi. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them during the chat session while the uh, presentations are going on. And hopefully we'll have a chance to um, answer those at the end of the, in the Q and A's. If you'd like to participate in the chat, just click the drop down directly above your comment and select the option, all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your comments. Okay, so here we go with the first presentation from Shane from Strata Title Consult. Shane's previous experience was gained while being employed at Langate for 35 years at the old titles office. During that period, Shane was primarily involved with the examination of registration documents and appointed as an assistant registrar of titles where he took a keen interest in the Strata Title Act. Shane was involved in various committees when the last changes to the Strata Title Act were enacted in 1995 and 1996. After leaving Leangate in 2013, Shane started working for himself as a Strata Consultant at Strata Title Consults Proprietary Limited, providing services relating to the interpretation of Strata plans and bylaws, re-subdivisions, mergers and conversions, attending Strata meetings and providing assistance in other Strata matters. Recent events have had Shane complete an appointment as an administrator of a Strata scheme which started out as a 12 month appointment and was extended for an additional six months. Okay, Shane, I'll let you lead with the presentation. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Nikki. Uh, so I've, uh, I'll try and address this clearer bylaws. If you went through the history of bylaws and how they were registered on a strata scheme, way back in 1966, when the Strata Titles Act first uh, took on its, uh, in, initial beginnings, it was only very thin, uh, about the size of a post-it note or uh, pad or less, and you didn't have to register the bylaws at all. 
the 85 Act came out and it said, well, now you've got to register them within two years. The amendments came out in 1996 or 95-96 and it specified you had to register them within three months. So within that period, the regulations, which I hold up a copy, uh, it's all back to front there. <laughs> Strata Titles General Regulations 2019, uh, that needs to be read in conjunction with the current version of the Act. So now any registration of bylaws will need to be held at a meeting where you have 28 days in which the voting opens and closes on a specified date and then the bylaws need to be registered within a three month period after that. So the bylaws themselves have varied from time to time, uh, especially especially from the beginnings in 1966, they were different in 85 and the current version have been changed again in that they have now specifically called the Schedule 1 bylaws, the governance uh, bylaws and Schedule 2 are the conduct bylaws. So what we have is um, I, uh, Sorry, Shane, can I just interrupt quickly? We're just wondering whether you can turn your microphone up a little bit. Some people are having trouble hearing your your volume, if that's okay. Tones. You might have to raise your voice a little bit. All right. Um, is that better? Is that better? Yep, I think all right. That's a little bit louder. Okay. So our current set of bylaws in the, in the current version of the 85 Act have governance and conduct section. So Schedule 1 is governance and Schedule 2 is conduct. Out of that, they have specified certain bylaws will remain in Schedule 1 uh, governance. Schedule, uh, and some bylaws have disappeared. So if you look at the Act in Schedule 1, you'll see that the bylaws 11 to 15 have been removed. They've been deleted out of the bylaws and have been specifically included into various different sections of the Act. It would have been nice if they included the whole bylaw as one different section, but they've split up all the different parts of those bylaws into different sections of the Act. So you'd need to refer to different uh, parts of the Act as they relate to holding meetings and the conduct of, of councils and elections and voting requirements. So the there were some bylaws that disappeared out of Schedule 1 because they were conduct type bylaws. So more behavioural related type bylaws that have now been included in Schedule 2 as a conduct bylaw. When we look at Schedule 2 conduct bylaws, one of the bylaws, which a lot of people seem to think was a pretty good bylaw to have, and it dealt with uh, Schedule 2 bylaw 5, uh, children playing on common property. and any unaccompanied child should have been, uh, well, any, any child should have been accompanied by an adult person or a person of responsibility. So that's been removed. It's been held to be discriminatory uh, because an adult includes people that are 16, 17 years of age and they tend to be having more responsibility than just a child of a lesser age. So that bylaw has been removed from Schedule 2. The, it's been done in, in a, an effort to make it clearer, uh, to define governance requirements and conduct requirements. Both of those areas are defined in the earlier part of the Act in Section 3, and it defines what a governance bylaw is and what a conduct bylaw is. So I don't know if we're going to get any questions directly from that part of what I'm going to talk about, but. Uh, your bylaws now will be subject to three different types of bylaws documents that have been created as part of the new suite of documents that Vangate has designed. And uh, I'm being very polite about that, that if you have bylaws now and you want to do a change, you will need to do a first consolidation of bylaws if you're one of the older schemes that existed prior to the 1st of May this year. And any changes, amendments or deletions of bylaws will result in a, a first consolidation document uh, to be lodged at Landgate. Within that document, you can, you can also include any changes to bylaws 
if you want to include additional bylaws or appeal, repeal or uh, add in any new bylaws. So it can all be done on the one document. The other two documents relate to any subsequent amendment of bylaws or the registration of new scheme bylaws for a new strata plan. So are we going to have any questions after these? each one of these, Nikki or? Uh, what we usually do, Shane, is let you go ahead with the presentation and then at the end of the session, we'll uh, go through the Q&A session at that point then, if that's okay. Sure. Okay, so the next part was legislation deadlines. And there's been a mad scramble for a lot of people to get a lot of things done, uh, particularly uh, as there is now a whole lot of new requirements that have been put on strata managers in particular and requirements for strata schemes to comply with certain things that are new in the Act. Um, the first one of my notes, I, I put that uh, strata managers need to uh, either be, uh, get qualified or have, have been qualified uh, within a five year period as of the 1st of May this year. There is also a financial year end date that uh, it, it catches everyone by surprise because it's located in section three of the Act and it specifies that if you don't register a bylaw uh, changing the date of your financial year, if after five years you haven't done so, your end of financial year or the date that you'll have your AGM is the 30th of June. And that's caused a lot of concern because a lot of the strata management companies don't want to be holding strata management meetings all around the 30th of June for every strata scheme that they manage. So if they, a large company that has 100, 200, 300 strata schemes, they don't want to be having to have all their AGMs around the 30th of June every year. So they need to register a bylaw that changes the end of financial year date. The, I've already gone through the bylaws and the, the first consolidation and amendments and repeals. You, if you want to sit pretty and not do anything, then that's fine. After five years, you'll then be supposedly having your AGMs around the 30th of June. You're not required to do anything unless you're going to change a bylaw, repeal a bylaw, or add in a new bylaw. Uh, another one that's a very important thing that uh, the owner is going to talk on afterwards is the, the need to have a 10 year plan. It was also covered last week uh, with uh, David Chocolich, uh, which is a 10 year maintenance plan and also like includes the lifespan of various items of common property within a small strata schemes or large strata schemes for that matter, uh, especially uh, air conditioning, plant and machinery, lifts. These things need to be regularly maintained and after a period of time, they'll need to be replaced. So there is a requirement to have a 10 year plan as of the 1st of May this year, you are required to have to have one uh, sorted out by your next annual general meeting. The, is also, there is also a requirement for a criminal record check for uh, strata uh, managers. Anyone that's dealing or handling with money will need to have a criminal record check done. And it's not that the criminal record check needs to be provided to the owners at a meeting and the strata manager needs to, or the principal of the business needs to provide a statement that they have done and carried out these criminal record checks on their staff that are directly result involved in handling of money uh, and finances of the strata scheme. And that needs to be done every three years. The, the, that part of it includes volunteer strata managers as well. So uh, they come under the list, uh, they come, well, the volunteer strata managers come under their own heading as volunteer strata managers, but within a strata management company, uh, the Act and the regs define a designated person as being either the principal of the business, the uh, strata manager directly involved with the management of the finances of the strata scheme that they're managing. And contracts of employment, these need to comply within six months. The um, contracts of employment, as at the 1st of May, there is a deadline of six months 
finishing on the 1st of November, uh, these contracts are covered under section 144 and 145 of the Act, where those uh, provisions specify what needs to be contained in the contract, the minimum requirements. And that's why the contracts need to be renewed. The time limit for the renewal is contained in the uh, transitional provisions within the Strata Title Act itself in Schedule 5, Clause 13. So when you look at uh, Schedule 5, Clause 13, which I did print it off, and it, uh, I did print it off, but I'll find it, that's fine. Just a minute. It's always fun having a computer right alongside you. Schedule one, schedule three, schedule five, clause 13, uh, applies even if the functions could not be authorised, the strata manager may continue to perform a scheme function under a contract or volunteer agreement with the strata company that is in force immediately before commencement day which is the 1st of May, for six months after that day, and this Act applies for that period, as if those functions were authorised to be performed by the strata manager under section 143, as if a contract or volunteer agreement were, were a strata management contract. Uh, sub clause three of clause 13, a contract or volunteer agreement referred to in sub clause one ceases to have effect six months after the commencement day, unless the strata manager then meets the requirements set out in section 144 and the contract or volunteer agreement then meets the requirements set out in section 145. So it's quite involved and they are the deadlines that I'm aware of that I've found in the Act. There is also the next topic, uh, councils. There are some new sections regarding councils in particular, which every person on council would need to be aware of or make themselves aware of because it directly informs how you need to conduct your business as a strata company. Particularly section 119, which is headed objectives, and it says, in performing its functions, a strata company is to have the objective of implementing processes and achieving outcomes that are not having regard to the use and enjoyment of lots and common property in the strata title scheme, A, unfairly prejudicial to or discriminatory against a person, or B, oppress oppressive or unreasonable. So, you just can't gang up on someone and deny them an opportunity to put a motion forward or vote at a meeting or just not allow them to do something. And if you're going to disallow something, you have to have a clear path of why you've arrived at that decision. But the other thing is that even if the vote of the majority outvotes that person, if it is held to be unfair, discriminatory, oppressive and unreasonable, it could be overturned at the tribunal. So that is part of the objectives. And you then have to look at section 137. Uh, some of these things were included in uh, the Schedule 1 bylaws previously, but they're now split up and included in the different sections of the Act. And this one comes under councils, under the, the division of councils. Section 137, uh, council members, in uh, regards to general duties and conflicts of interest. The most important part of this is, that I think is something that people need to be aware of, apart from conflicts of interest, under 137.2 of the Act, a person to whom this section applies must at all times act honestly, with loyalty and in good faith in the performance of functions as a member of the council or an officer of the strata company. 
uh, when they say an officer, they're saying a council member. Uh, they must at all times exercise degree, a degree of care and diligence in the performance of these functions that a, a reasonable person in the person's position and the circumstances of a strata company would reasonably be expected to exercise. They must not make improper use of the person's position uh, to gain directly or indirectly an advantage for the person or any other person or to cause detriment to the strata company. These are far wide ranging um, areas that will affect a lot of decision making processes that the council may be engaged in. And if you're going to make a controversial decision, do you need to document how you've arrived at that decision and on what basis you've made that interpretation? And it, it, at the end of the day, it may still be held to be invalid because you've been unfair, prejudicial, oppressive or unreasonable. Um, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not trying to give you legal advice, but I'm certainly giving you a good warning that the Act has more far reaching implications and responsibilities put on council members. So if you don't have a copy of the strata uh, regulations, you can obtain a, or download a copy of the regulations free of charge from a state government website, which is www.legislation.wa.gov.au. And it's just a matter of looking up the alphabetical listings for acts in force or subsequent uh, uh, legislation being the regulations. So that basically covers some of the topics that uh, I had to answer uh, or to, to address in the, my presentation, Nikki. So. Excellent. Thanks so much, Shane. That was excellent. Um, well, we'll certainly jump back to you. We've got quite a few questions that have come in because you've covered a broad range of topics. So uh, at the end of the session, we'll jump back to you, I'm sure, and spend quite a bit of time um, running through some questions with you. Okay, so we're moving on to the next presentation, which is Leonie. Hey, Nikki, I'm just going to share the screen. Okay, excellent. And I'll just do an introduction for you too, Leonie. Um, okay, so Leonie Milliners from PSC Property Link Insurance Brokers. Property Link Insurance Brokers, Propriety Limited, is a special, specialty strata and property insurance broker and risk advisory service. They connect strata managers and property owners with tailored insurance plans and strata insurers with a mission to build a trusted and respected insurance and risk advisory business. PCS Property Link was started in 2017 by General Manager Leonie Melanis. Leonie is a strata insurer specialist with over 12 years experience specialising in strata insurance. With an incredible passion for strata, Leonie also volunteers with SCAWA education and PD committees. Okay, so I'll leave Leonie to present now. And I think Leonie, you've just got mute on your microphone. I have, I can't actually share the screen for some reason. Oh, we can see your screen. We've actually got your shared screen up now. Oh, you can see the PowerPoint? Yeah. So I think if you play the presentation, we should, yeah, we should be fine. And we can see you speaking as well, which is great. Okay, I'll have to put it up. So I can't see it on my screen, unfortunately. Okay. Um, it, anyway, good afternoon, everybody. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, in my presentation this afternoon, I'm um, discussing aspects around a 10-year uh, plans specific to maintenance planning and highlighting some issue con insurance con uh, considerations because of this new requirement. I'll also be highlighting some uh, general terms. Uh, as highlighted uh, by Nikki, uh, general disclosure, I'm in insurance, so just pointing out that my presentation this afternoon is not legal advice and should not be relied on as legal or insurance advice and that you need to consult a qualified insurance person or legal advisor. So the current state of play, um, a common uh, uh, question that comes up from insurers at this point in time is do you have any known defects? 
since May this year, we are starting to see building reports coming through in our office. And this is resulting uh, from an increase for the requirement of 10 year plans, which are being used to justify that the building is in either good condition or an issue has been identified. Throughout um, my presentation, I refer to the Strata Titles Act 1985 as amended in 2018 as STA. I also refer to the Strata Company as SC. Other terms I'm highlighting in my presentation, I will elaborate as I go through, and that is common property, designated strata company, scheme building, insurable asset, and covered items. There are some other terms I'll be touching on around insurance type terms as well. So just starting on the, to do with 10 year plans for uh, maintain, maintenance planning. A 10 year plan is required to be compiled for maintenance planning. And as I refer to this as an ongoing report, forecasting 10 years ahead and reviewed every five years for the next 10 years ahead. It's a living, breathing report required as per the Strata Titles Act for a designated strata company. It's required to forecast and plan maintenance ahead of time for common and personal property of the strata company. Identify and ensuring funding is in place so that the building and property remains in good condition through renewal, repair or replacement of all the covered items. A designated strata company is a strata company defined by size, 10 or more lots, or a scheme building replacement cost of five million or more. So for an expanded definition, you do need to refer to the Strata Titles Act and the regulations for these terms. A scheme building is a building shown on a plan or not, as defined both in the Strata Titles Act and the regulations. Covered items for repair, renewal or replacement as referenced in the regulations are for common property or personal property of the strata company. A 10 year plan forecasts maintenance requirements in the future, but it's not for routine maintenance, which is of an ongoing nature and a more immediate requirement. In the regulations, it does list out most of all the main items, parts of the building, property or fixtures that form part of common property or personal property of the strata company. These items for insurance purposes are insurable assets for insurance purposes. Insurable asset means common property of the scheme, including fixtures and improvements on common property, but it also includes scheme building that comprise of lots in the scheme. So examples, examples of covered items are common property, for example, roof, gutters, floors, walls, ceilings, driveways, footpaths, steps, foundations, buildings, windows, and so forth. Personal property of the Strata Company may include items like vehicles, computers, gardening and maintenance equipment, and signage. We often refer personal property as common area contents when it comes to insurance. But for a full list of those covered items, you do need to refer to the regulations. The regulations say a 10 year plan may be developed by the strata company engaging the specialist, also the qualifications, if any, of the person preparing the report. So three areas of a 10 year plan that has insurance considerations, in my opinion, as follows. Routine maintenance does not form part of it. However, that does not mean you don't attend to routine maintenance. The Strata Titles Act focuses on 10 year plan requirement for designated strata companies. However, what happens with the other strata companies 
who are not designated strata companies and maintenance. And lastly, uh, what does condition reporting really mean? So I'll start with routine maintenance. With reference to maintenance, whether it's routine in nature or long-term planning for renewal, repair or replacement, both actions are important. Routine maintenance is regular in nature and generally described as checking, testing, cleaning and smaller repairs, for example, um, cleaning of swimming pools, leaf debris from gutters, testing equipment to make sure it's operational, checking driveways and common areas for any unforeseen damage like potholes, dislodged pavement, smaller and minor repairs undertaken to prevent major maintenance defects. So lack of maintenance can lead to public liability risks associated to negligence of the strata company as they did not repair the pothole that an unsuspecting motorist has now damaged their car on. Or lack of maintenance can also affect an owner of a lot as an issue that has gone unrepaired has allowed water to ingress into a lot. Overall, a well-maintained building usually leads to less frequency of many claim types such as worn plumbing, pipes that burst causing major resultant water damage or cracked roof tiles letting water into the building or even rusted gutters and pipes causing gradual damage over time. Insurance is designed uh, for claiming damage that is accidental and unforeseen events. With the implement implementation of 10 year planning for maintenance, it may over time improve scheme buildings and improve insurance arrangements. Insurers will recognise that stratas with less claims are also demonstrating that they are looking after common property and the scheme building. The opposite is more claims means higher premiums higher excesses and less availability of insurance options. A designated strata company uh, wanted to touch here on a general duty that is in the Act and it also was in the uh, old version of the Act. And a strata company has a duty to maintain common property and to ensure it is in good and serviceable repair, properly maintained and if necessary, renewed and replaced. Therefore, maintenance planning may benefit all strata companies. It may also provide benefit to all owners by improving their property investment for the longer term. Noting again, however, that the Strata Titles Act for 10 year plan requires designated strata companies to adopt this. Condition reporting within the, regulate, within the regulations requires the strata company to report with consideration given to appropriate design, age and overall condition of the covered items as listed in the regulations. The regulations require the reporting to comment on present condition or operating state, including working or not of the covered items. This aspect is important to insurance as the condition of the covered item will become known to the strata company. So this brings me to a favourite insurance term called duty of disclosure or duty to disclose. Condition reporting may uncover hidden maintenance defects of your building that you were previously unaware of. When this becomes known, you need to consider your insurance policy, particularly at renewal. Most strata insurance policies cover for accidental damage unless otherwise excluded. Known defects are an exclusion of insurance policies. So depending on what it is, this may give rise to your duty to disclose. Exercising your duty, the insurer will be concerned with any major maintenance defects now declared and what may be an immediate risk management requirement or any temporary make safe repairs that need to be undertaken. Further, the insurer will be concerned with any major maintenance defects now declared and what may be an immediate um, risk management requirement or any temporary make safe repairs. Further, the insurer will be wanting to know what is the strata company's approach 
get it towards getting repairs done now that a maintenance defect has been discovered despite a 10 year plan. This may lead to unplanned but urgent maintenance to be undertaken as it may have immediate insurance implications. So some examples of maintenance and uh, like major defect type ones could be roof timber beams have identified termite infestations, leaving an unstable roof. Or one that we do see from time to time is concrete cancer developed around balcony balustrades. The insurer will want to know what safe measures are being put in place and then the long term approach to repairing the issue. So how does Strata Insurance respond to alterations and upgrades should unforeseen maintenance be required? It really depends on what it is and the likely project value. What you should refer to your, you should refer to your policy wording and advise your insurer. Most Strata wordings make allowances within their coverage to provide some cover for alterations and upgrades. Depending on the size and the value, various wordings restrict, restrict by limiting the cost of the project to a specific limit. An insurer may agree to cover higher amounts, but this needs to be approved by your insurer upon request. Further, if contract works insurance is required as a result of a building contract between the strata company and the builder, then the strata insurance may not apply as the project is then covered by the contract works insurance. However, the insurer should still be notified of the building project as insurance for the scheme building is still required. Contract works insurance is an insurance policy usually taken out by the builder, insuring against loss or damage to the building project, including public liability. I wanted to raise uh, this one, temporary common property. And temporary common property is just a new term um, for land that may be leased by a strata company. So in respect to temporary common pro property, your obligations are likely to be defined by the lease, but generally your strata insurance will be required to extend to temporary common property. Therefore, maintenance obligations may also extend to this. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm not clear in relation to 10 year plans, potentially not, but definitely um, under your lease, if you're required to care and maintain that area, then it may fall under also a requirement for your insurance. Your lease would generally expand on what your obligations are. Infrastructure contract and maintenance. Infrastructure contracts is a new term phrased out of utility and sustainability infrastructure easements. This may apply where the strata company and the owner enter into a contract where the owner becomes known as an infrastructure owner. A typical example is solar panels installed on common property. However, the benefit of solar is for the owner. The Strata Titles Act and regulation highlight that the owner is required to maintain, repair, modify, replace this infrastructure, but they are also responsible for common property parts that the infrastructure sits on or above. This is important as the roof on which the solar panel sits is still common property and consideration of a 10 year planning of roof maintenance may also need to take into account any infrastructure contracts where maintenance of infrastructure and common property that forms the easement area might be the responsibility of the uh, owner. So that concludes what I was going to talk about. But in summary, long term uh, 10 year plans for maintenance planning has been a good inclusion into the Act. Whilst it will take a number of years to fully implement over time, it will definitely help improve the life of many strata scheme buildings. As far as insurance is concerned, it will hopefully reduce the amount of claims occurring in strata that are triggered due to maintenance related issues. It's important to remember that condition reporting may highlight previously unknown issues that need to be disclosed to your insurer at renewal or any urgent issues may need to be dealt with ahead of any 10 year plan, which is completely unplanned. 
So with that, I thank you for listening and uh, wait for any questions. Thank you, Nikki. Thanks very much, Leanne. That was great. Um, if you can just um, screen, unshare your screen when you get a chance. And what we might do now is just jump into the questions because, as I said, we've got quite a few that we already had sent in and then quite a few that have been asked. Um, and thanks, Shane, you've been jumping in there and, and typing away and answering some of the questions as well, which has been really helpful because there is quite a few to get through. But I might stay with you firstly, only since I've got you here. Um, one of the questions that came in, can you please highlight any specific changes, requirements for insurance where the starter company has mixed use commercial and residential use? i.e. can we hold a joint policy for instance or require separate ones for commercial residential areas of common property? Thanks, Nikki. Um, it doesn't, within the Act, from my uh, understanding, it doesn't actually differentiate like that. Um, insurance is, comes under two areas. Section 97, required insurance, and another section under for specifically single tier insurance. So if you read through what the Act requires, it just basically states that you must insure for the replacement value for your uh, insurable assets and obviously for public liability insurance. It doesn't um, provide uh, you know, a difference between mixed use, commercial or um, residential other than when it comes to things like internals, like proprietors, fix, fixings and things like that. Commercial is a little bit different. So the question really is around, can something different be done with the insurance arrangements? So there are a mixed different uh, arrangements that we can do. Um, brokers uh, around the country can do different things. Uh, so it really just depends on the, the specific circumstances of that scheme as to what we can do. Okay, excellent, thank you so much. And we have another one, Leonie, that I might ask you as well, we're here. What happens if the action items in the proposed 10 year plan as presented to the insurer isn't undertaken due to unforeseen circumstances? Does the insurer have a right to refuse a claim for property damage, for example? That was from Pixie. Okay. It's very important that if a and an urgent, like a, I guess a, it's been rated as a high issue, uh, that it is attended and you're working with the insurer. Uh, what we do is we, when we get notified of a, a, a potential, I call it a maintenance defect, uh, we would advise the insurer and we work with the strata to, and the strata manager to make sure that any make safe uh, arrangements are done. Usually the insurers will continue to uh, look after, indemnify that strata, but they'll definitely be looking for that particular problem to be remedied and fixed as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Shane, I might jump to you for a few questions now. Uh, so one of the ones we've got is, uh, what is required to exceed a budget amount, i.e. non-capital items? That's from Brian. Budget, you can, uh, the, the actual budget amount used to be $165. It's now been increased to $500, uh, an amount where the Strata Council can approve expenditure without going to a general meeting. There are certain circumstances where that's limited in that it can only be up to that amount in any one financial year, or you need to vary the budget uh, at a general meeting, which would require a special resolution. So that's it in a nutshell. Okay, great. And I might stick with you. Um, so one of them that, that we have from Glenda, a few owners in our strata company would like a clear understanding of a couple of bylaws listed below. So a question is, can a member of the strata council use a proxy vote to elect themselves on the strata council? Is this classed as a service to the strata company as listed in section 1252, which is disqualification from proxy, from voting as a proxy. I think you have to look at the intention of the, the proxy document. Did the proxy form actually specify that the person giving the proxy 
specifically said, I want to nominate you to be on the council, then the person using the proxy would be following what the proxy had directed them to do. If there was no specification, then there'd definitely be a conflict. I would perceive that there'd be a conflict of interest if the person used that proxy to their own advantage to elect themselves. And I'm not a lawyer. You might need to get a legal definition on that. But um, I think that if it's an open proxy, then the person can use it as they see fit, but if it's a directed proxy, then it's definite and certain that the person giving the proxy wanted to have that per the, the, bene the benefited person of the proxy, the person who's acting as a proxy, to be their nominated candidate for the council. Okay, thank you. And then from that same um, lady, I'd like to also mention another question we had come in. If the strata manager contract expires after an AGM, should a resolution be made to renew the management contract contract prior to the AGM? Or does the contract continue until the end date? And if so, is a general meeting required to continue the contract and pass the additional costs for the strata manager? If it finished at the annual general meeting, there should have been a motion on the agenda to renew the contract. Being that there is a deadline that all new contracts must comply with the Act um, before the, the uh, 1st of November, any present, if, the, if there was a resolution at the meeting or, or an item of general business at the meeting to elect a new um, strata manager or review the contract, then the contract ceases at the, the end of that meeting uh, as my interpretation of that um, question. So unless there's a presentation of another contract uh, with new, renewed terms and complies with uh, section 144 and 145 of the Act, uh, especially 145 because that has the minimum requirements, um, then you're, you're at the mercy of the meeting. Uh, it, it should be dealt with, um, someone should, should move a motion to deal with it at that meeting as to who's going to be the next um, strata manager or whether the, the, the current strata manager's uh, contract is renewed. Thanks, Shane. Uh, okay, we have another one, Shane. I'll stay with you. Um, and I think we've, we, we have mentioned this before, but we might just um, go over this question uh, just to make sure it's fully covered. In my strata, we have bylaws that reference sections of the previous Act, Schedule 1 and 2. Is there a need to revise the bylaws management statement so they refer to the new Act or sections? Or is it okay to maintain our bylaws even with reference to the previous versions of the Act unchanged? Therein lies the problem. As soon as you want to change any of those bylaws, uh, the consolidation process allows you to bring forward, like give you a free hit at bringing forward all the old bylaws into the new format and adopting the new standard schedule one and two bylaws. The problem is that your existing bylaws may refer or refer to bylaws that have been removed from the current Schedule 1 bylaws, the governance bylaws being 11, and 15, 11 to 15 that have been removed, the things that deal with voting and election of council, uh, common seal, those things have been removed and incorporated as part of the, the Act. The, it might retain, the, the management statement might retain bylaws that deal with uh, a quorum, which is now dealt with in the Act, and the Act will supersede any bylaw that's been created. Uh, there are penalties, penalty bylaws, the, the Act covers those. Uh, references to levies being under Section 36 would, if you're going to do a change, then it's up to the strata company whether they want to go through the motions to change every bylaw that refers to a redundant section. And it may need, depending if it's a governance bylaw, it would require a resolution without dissent. And if it was a conduct bylaw, it would need to be a special resolution because you're actually changing the bylaw. The consolidation only applies to bylaws that are just directly brought over and renumbered in accordance with the 
new bylaws that are in the, the current version of the Act. I hope that uh, makes it clear. <laughs> okay, thank you. And we do have another one for Leone. So if I can just grab you again, Leone. Uh, this one's coming from Robert. Um, hello, Leone. Can you tell me an insurer's attitude where, where an owner without authority modifies common property and then claims on insurance for consequential damage caused by those modifications? That one I would probably have to take off. Um, uh, unable to answer that one uh, in this forum, Nikki, but I'll be happy to take that one offline. Okay, excellent, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, and Shane, I'll just jump back to you. Uh, so this one is from Dean. Um, I understand the newly reform act will provide an easy path to having separate multiple strata bodies for mixed use buildings. Where we have a number of commercial offices and a number of residential lots, is it feasible and easier under the new act to separate these two interests? How do we deal with the common property? And currently our common property is being funded in line with entitlement units, which is entirely unfair due to the large amount of commercial traffic or usage compared to the very minimal traffic usage of the residentials. Can this be recalculated on a fairer user pay system under the new act? I believe some of those things could have been dealt with under the old act as well, but my interpretation of that, not that I'm giving legal advice, but if there are different operating groups within the one building, a commercial, retail, residential, the, this can be dealt with by split budgets, which is not an uncommon thing. There are many strata schemes that have commercial, residential and uh, retail within the one building and each different um, group of use areas uh, or the shops or the food preparation areas will have particular bylaws drafted for them that cater for uh, specific expenses that are directly attributed to uh, the removal of uh, food waste and scraps, the uh, office cleaning uh, foyers, uh, removal of rubbish, particular to uh, commercial premises, as opposed to removal of rubbish pertaining to uh, residential premises. So a split budget and split or segregated areas within the management statement or a uh, customised set of bylaws for that particular strata scheme can be dealt with by apportioning the costs attributed to different cost centres uh, by some other means other than by the unit entitlement values. And in some instances, the, a, a group within a, a cost centre may have that particular cost attributed to that cost centre split uh, equally or as per the unit entitlements for each of those units that are within that cost centre or a contribution is made by that cost centre to contribute to the strata company in general for a particular service or function or repair or maintenance of a particular item of common property that everybody uses or services uh, or derives a service from. So that's as general as I can get as an answer because I haven't seen the Bibles or the, the condition of what, what the building is. Okay, thanks Shane. Uh, and we have another one for you, Shane. I'm a volunteer strata manager. Would I be exempt from all of these new rules? No. Short, short answer, no. <laughs> you, you still have to have a criminal uh, record check done. You're not required to get the educational qualifications, but there are, uh, without, uh, yeah, I know that you, you still have to have a criminal record check and there are particular requirements for volunteer strata managers and they are specifically dealt with in the Act. I can't quote them off the top of my head at this point in time. I haven't read the Act sufficiently well enough to recite it uh, to cover that. Um, but I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you so much. I'm just having a look. We did have a few more that came in. Um, what happens to a current contract which may extend for several years? Can the additional requirements be added as an extension, 
uh, sorry, as an annexure signed by the CAO, and can they refuse? Look, if it's a, <clears throat> an existing contract, the Act's quite clear that there's only the six month period from the 1st of May, and after that, the 1st, the 1st of November, they have to have a new contract in place. So it has to be compliant with section 144 and uh, comply with all those conditions as to whether or not the strata company through the council want to negotiate a new fee with the strata management company. That's entirely between those two parties. Okay, thanks Shane. I'm just scrolling through to find one more. Uh, if a strata company does not employ a strata manager, but instead the strata is maintained by the council of owners, is the council of owners allowed to employ a bookkeeper on a contract basis? The bookkeeper does book work only and has no part in strata issues. We've been told that because of the new laws, the strata council cannot hire the bookkeeper on a contract basis, but instead must actually employ the bookkeeper. Is this correct? I can't answer that question directly. So okay. I can't see any problem with um, having the strata company or the strata council get the services of a bookkeeper to maintain their, their financial records. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much. We're coming up to three o'clock now. And so we might, um, yeah, we've answered all of those questions. If we didn't have a chance to get to your question, please leave that with us and we'll do our very best to get a response either back to you or onto the site. Um, and yeah, thank you so much to Shane and Leonie for spending this session with us. It's been a pleasure. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for, for attending and um, yeah, hopefully we'll see you soon.